The Legit Podcast is sponsored by Montrex. Montrex is a cutting edge sportswear brand empowering athletes across the world, built to enhance performance and give you confidence to go the extra mile. They've got some of the most incredible products at montrex.com. There is a link below this video. Click the link and at checkout, enter the code LEGIT for 15% off your order. That's L-E-G-I-T, all one word. Everything from jackets, cargo pants, gym tops, t-shirts, uh, running jackets, running pants. Everything is on their website and they sponsor some of the most incredible athletes. Everything from UFC fighter Leon Edwards and a good friend of the podcast, uh, boxer Jazza Dickens. So click the link below, use the code LEGIT at checkout for 15% off your order. Welcome to the Legit Podcast. It's me, Jordan Neal. It's me, Andy Grant. And this week's guest is Martin Stapleton. Martin, right, yes. 50 Carl Stapleton is still going <laughs> yeah, by that yeah, name. Still on, yeah, yeah. So, mate, I, uh, my first memory of you, mate, is a 17-year-old nod, which is a Bowl Marine recruit. And um, obviously you've been in the PTI branch, so PTI is a physical training instructor. And you've got this kind of aura of being, you know, gods among men, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, just this fear runs, you know, through your veins when you see you lads there um, going to get beasted. And that was my first first impression of you. And I didn't get to serve alongside you properly in that sense. But what I, what I remember from you, mate, is you when MMA and kind of cage fighting and thing like it wasn't even a thing no. you you were yeah, in yeah. on it yeah, yeah. From it seems from, from day one yeah 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 I mean me, do, do you remember Pete Jordan no so w w when would that have been then? Mate, 2006 yeah so that would have been just after I passed my PTI of course Pete Jordan he would have been at 40 commando or something then I think but he was like a colour sergeant back then and me and him were at 40 together and we've trained MMA every day, like, and he was just like a big, horrible, he's like a BJJ brown belt. He, he'd be, a, he's by far a black belt, but he don't bother grading. Uh, England squad boxer. And he was like the original bootneck MMA guy. I think he had like 10 fights or something like that. And he like taught me for the first couple of years while I was in the corps, like, mm. and that, and like, but we had to keep it secret, like you're saying, because back in them, it, it wasn't legit. You yeah. couldn't do it in the corps. There was no grappling or anything. There was no jujitsu association. So yeah, we had to, Keep it on the down low. But, um, yeah, because no I, 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 I didn't realise I'd. Uh, I'd yeah. Was that. Can I swear on this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> was that a wanker? <laughs> you know, you were just. You were just mate, it's a, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a sad story, mate, because uh, obviously you will have been uh, good mates with Ben, Ben Novak. Well, I wasn't actually a good mate. I, I didn't really I did know, not know him, no. No, but I, I, I did know him. I was just assumed because you're both PTIs, yeah. yeah well, he was, my, he was my PTI. Oh, man. Um, and I just think through him being a PTI and then obviously mate you just I just think PTI is not blowing smoke up your ass I just mega inspiring P I think as a as a recruit going through I always thought you know you want to be a PTI because they're all just these machines fit as fuck and that's kind of what you aspire to so for me mate yeah it was yeah. as much as I didn't like you at the time um, what I'm getting told to I don't do you, do you remember uh, Ball Ball Champ he was a sound major no. well, well he he was a sound major when I went through my twos course he was my sound major at 40 commando as well he was a big inspiration for me to be a PTI um, his saying about PTIs was, you're not there to light a fire underneath people, you're there to light a fire within them. Because, you know, the big thing people get wrong in the military is you light a fire under these cunts, you're like screaming and shouting. But as a PTI, that's the wrong thing. What you should be doing is lighting a fire within them, you know, giving them, setting an example that makes them want to work hard, not have to work hard, do you get what I mean? Yeah. Mm. So I think that's what the PT branch aspires to do. Um, I think it does it so well as well. Yeah, I do as well. The Royal Marines PT branch. I, I, I learnt so much from the people in that branch. You know, um, I, I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now. I don't think if I, if I wouldn't have been a PTI. So I mean, without skipping too far ahead, but no, that you've obviously you've gone into coaching MMA. So that's obviously all had a massive founding massive, foundation. Yeah, huge. Yeah, huge. Yeah, absolutely. Before we go into the MMA, then mate, the core. Talk to me about why why you want to join. Is it the normal kind of wanting to just get away, join and make something of yourself? Or what was it? No, do you know what? Like I I was um, so like like I hated school, man. I, I literally hated school. I was telling this story the other day actually about my exams. Like when I did my exams at school, I didn't do any exams. I sat down and drew BMX bikes on the fucking exam papers because <laughs> that's what I was into. Well, like, that. I hated school, I hated all the lessons and all that, and I love BMX bikes. Yeah. So just as a bit of protest, I literally sat there drawing BMX bikes on the fucking paper, and I never actually knew what I wanted to do leaving school. I always knew that I never wanted to kind of go into a normal nine to five job. 
Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And then my best mate, Matty Williams, he's actually a fireman now. He was like, have you ever thought about joining the army and stuff? And I was like, yeah, because my dad was in the army as well. And my dad, again, my dad was a big inspiration. He still is a big inspiration for me, my dad. Uh, and he was like, have you heard of the Royal Marine Commandos? And I was like, no, what are them? He was like, mate, they're like the army, but on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> and he showed us all these magazines. And I was like, Loved. fucking hell. And that was it. They just, from one day, I'd never heard of them. The next day I applied. I was like, what? Yeah, let's apply. Imagine how many stories are like that. You know, yeah, you know, like, yeah. No idea what like what you're going into or whatever, mm. but you just see and you think that's so cool. Let me do that. Yeah, but it brings up that point that you say about school. It just obviously it's designed for certain people, isn't it? But yeah, like, you're a big advocate. You always say it. Don't it hates me. Yeah, like I was good at school and like went through it and you know enjoyed education, but I hated the fact that you know someone who was good at drawing or someone who was sort of you know just something outside of the lines would yeah. get would get automatically get put as know, you're you're like a disruption or you're an idiot with yeah the thing is we've, and i don't say this in a bad way t towards teachers because they obviously do a great job i couldn't do that job yeah. you know they're a lot better person than i am in that way but i do fight, feel that the schooling system in general doesn't necessarily teach people to think it teaches people to remember yeah, yeah. information and regurgitate it it's a memory it's a memory test yes yeah, yeah exactly yeah. whereas like um certain kids like mm. like I, I was that way i, I that's, that's yeah. not what I, I couldn't remember and regurgitate something that i wasn't yeah. interested in because if i'm not interested in it it's gone yeah mm. um i think there's certain teachers who you'll find and they'll be like you know they'll find your talent and they'll, they'll maybe push it or yeah as an individual but yeah. the whole consensus or the whole curriculum is is dependent on people who can remember well remember yeah. well yeah, yeah. And and that, it's, and it's hard to and, and the thing is you remember it for that one specific yeah. day yeah and then it's gone and then it's just not needed anymore you don't need it anymore it's gone yeah. and the amount of people obviously you're a success story and there's plenty of other success success stories but the amount of people who then slip through the net and think i'm just i'm rubbish at everything exactly Do you know what i mean exactly. and then their mentality for the rest of life is well i'm not that good at anything it, well, yeah. what's the old saying? Like, if you if you judged a fish on its, its ability to climb, climb a tree, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. then you'd say it was an idiot. Yeah. But if yeah. you judged the monkey on its ability to swim, you'd say that was an idiot. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So true. So, yeah. If I can put one little message out there while we're on this subject to any kids that have just done the GCSEs and were interested in all that sort of stuff, just like I was, then trust me, your time will come. You will find someone and you keep looking for it. Yeah. No, mate. It's an important and and again, so someone. As successful as you to hear, I think for young people to hear someone like you say that, it, it's great, mate. I think I was the same, mate, in the sense of, um, I mean, I'd done all right in school, but I think it was that law of, like, again, like the army on steroids. It's like, who the fuck are these people? Like, uh, I went on a Meet the Marines Day and um, a couple of lads come to Liverpool and they were just like, I don't know, good looking lads, you know, fit yeah. as fuck. And, team essence. Yeah, team essence. <laughs> you know, they've been on the they've been on the piss the night before and he was talking about like what birds they, they pulled and all that. And still crack out 20 pull-ups. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's all like lingo, like again, like so into the same birds you pulled, these same birds have trapped. And then rather than going out on the piss, you'd say I've been a, been on a run ashore. Yeah. And I'm like, what are these talking about? Like, what the fuck are they? And a it, world inside a world. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it's just yeah. completely yeah. Yeah. It was just something about it, and I was yeah. like, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> I want to be a part of that. Yeah, yeah. That's what it's like, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Totally. So how old was you when you joined? 17. 17, yeah, yeah 17, 17 as well. Oh, yeah, nice one. And then how did your career pan out then? Did, did you get screwed with the uh, under 18 thing as well? So like, I left after 12 years thinking I was getting an half pension because I joined at 17. Yeah, yeah. Bit don't care. It doesn't right? count, yeah, don't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh I was God. like, but I've done 12 years. And they were like, yeah, but your first bit was 17. I was like... So, like, yeah, don't count towards your pension. <laughs> ah, right, nice one. Feels so young that, like, Cheers, seventeen to, to like. Yeah. To, for someone like me who's never had the experience of what you've gone like done, it just seems young. Do you know what I mean? Emotionally, mm. like. Yeah. Do you know, to very be much so, yeah. put into a situation. I was pretty like lucky because um, one of my best mates, a lad called Wayne Shaler, I don't know if you ever came across him in the call. He's he's still in. He's a uh, sat merger now. Me and him actually applied together. We'd done the PRMC together and we joined the same recruit troop together. Mm. So we went through all the training together. So I had that a little bit of like backup, yeah, if you would, you know. I think if it weren't for us being together, it would have been a lot harder. Yeah. Basic training, because you know what it's like? It's fucking mm. horrible, isn't it? I don't think I could do basic training again now. Yeah. You know, but um, yeah, I had that little bit of, um, you know, my mate with me, that little yeah, bit of yeah. um, support. So it made it a lot easier for me in that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm on the same. I, I didn't ever think I was young, but when I look back, and yeah. now I think, fucking hell. I think it's when you get to age, isn't it? Like, I look back at myself at 17 and think, 
what a wanker. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's just like immature, like, do you know what yeah, I mean? I looked back you... at myself last week. To get put into like a situation like that where you've got to be so mentally strong and you know, you've got to push yourself to certain boundaries and stuff. Mm. Just seems young, but yeah. see, it's part of the process, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. I mean, so passing out to Royal Marine training, where did your career take you then? Um, so I, as soon as I passed out, I went to 4-2 Commando and um, I was pretty lucky again. I feel like I had a really, really lucky career in the court because you know you speak to some blokes and they had a shit draft here yeah. and they spent, for those who are listening at home, a draft means like, um, how would you explain it? Like, um, like, like a place, like two year place. Yeah, yeah. Um, I never had that. I had really good drafts all the time and I got loads, loads of really good trips and I had really, really good people in charge of me all the time. I never had a time where I had wankers in charge of me or anything. I, I was really lucky in my time in the Corps. But yeah, I passed out, went to 4-2 Commando and we got straight on exercise Black Horse. Did you ever get to do a Black no, Horse? No, did I fuck? I know all about <laughs> it though. Fucking See, I'm one of those blokes who had a shit... Nah, I didn't have a shit... But I didn't have a shit time, but I know what you mean though. Fucking hell, I had a shit time. I've got a lot of love in Yeah. Oh, mate, you have to explain Black Horse. This was, oh, for anyone mate. who didn't do it, it was like this elusive dream that yeah. one day you could go on it. Yeah, it was like they carry the dangling <laughs> yeah. so Black Horse was like and again I would have been 18 by then I think but for a young 18 year old lad you, you fly out to America you do you do about a month or so in the Rocky Mountains doing like mountain training and it's fucking awesome it is absolutely brilliant you know you're out there's lads there's lads on mule packers course you know learning how to steer mules and pack yeah. them because they have to carry heavy weapons up the, the mountain sides and that uh, you were the US Marines and Rangers and stuff, and it, it's brilliant. You're just out in the mountains for about a month, um, learning mountain warfare. It's physically horrible, you know. It's a really, really because you're either walking like that or like yeah. that. Uh, I don't see. I don't think there's a flat surface out there, you know. But uh, <laughs> it, it was amazing. You finish that and you go straight to the desert to a place called Twenty Nine Palms, and then you do like a month or so. I think it's about a month anyway. A month or so desert package where you're doing all the desert firing. And it's all live firing, so it's all. No, no blank stuff, it's all field fire, all yeah. the exercises you're doing, you're firing real rounds. So it gives you that extra bit of buzz, doesn't it? Because you know, you're, you're attacking a target and there's real bullets coming over your head as you go in, as opposed to a lot of the time when you're on exercise, it's blanks. Yeah. So you do that, and again, that was brilliant. Um, I was the I was the mortarman on that, the, the mm. troop mortarman. Yeah. You know, because being the sprog, being the young guy, you just get, yeah, carry that mortar and all them rounds, so it's like fucking ridiculous amount of weight. Um, but it was fun. And then at the end of it, you get like 10 days R&R, &R, 10 days leave. So we went to San Francisco for three days. We went to Reno for a couple of days and then obviously ended up in Vegas for the last three or four <laughs> days. Like, yeah. You spent every penny that you'd saved on the last two months yeah. of exercise and went home skin. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Oh, man, honestly, God, absolutely. I think that kind of set off my... Um, like passion if it was for travelling and going to different countries and meeting yeah. people because that was the first time I'd really, really I was on the one of the recruit troops in basic training while foot and mouth disease was in really yeah yeah so during my basic training we actually went to West Virginia for a month fucking hell yeah so foot, foot and mouth disease was in on um, oh, so you done part of your training yeah in, wow. in West Virginia yeah so the foot and mouth disease. have the best career. <laughs> <in the world. laughs> no, that's what I mean. <laughs> Just landed on my feet. <laughs> uh, the foot and mouth disease came in. So like, for those younger listening to it, it was like a, some sort of animal disease that was mm. like sheep and horse yeah, and that. Yeah. So no one was allowed on any of the moors. So you weren't allowed to go on exercise because they didn't want you to pass the disease on. Um, so we couldn't. The recruits couldn't go on exercise. So they flew us all to West Virginia, and we did like a month exercise in like all the swamps out there, and it was fucking horrible like conditions for soldiering in because mm. I don't think I ever walked in anything less than ankle deep water for about a month but it's red and it's red hot as well it's like semi jungly sort of terrain um, and yeah we got a month there in West Virginia then again we got a few days off at the end and that was that was still in basic training yeah. so you know what I'm saying I was lucky and there's yeah. me, I went to Arbroath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Freezing. <laughs> They're your needy. <laughs> he, he, he went and got frostbite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not quite as glamorous, that. Like. No. Uh, but I mean, again, mate, what, what the Marines can do is, you know, like a young 17-year-old lad from the northwest, yeah. and then he finds himself. It, exactly, mate. Yeah, exactly. It's a character building thing, isn't it? I mean, because, like, you know, on a much smaller scale, like when I moved away for education and stuff like that, you, your mind widens so much 
from someone who's so insular. But like yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. on a, it was on a much bigger scale. But you suddenly realise like, wow, well, life's quite big. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Much you talk all the time, don't you? When you yeah. went to Loughborough Uni, and it yeah. was just like, wow. Yeah. yeah. Like some of my yeah. mates are from like you know the opposite end of the country now. Some of my best yeah. mates, but yeah. like before that, you'd have never even given the time of the day. Do you know what I mean? You'd just yeah. been like, you know, I'm at home. This is me. Yeah. But it's it's so like the positives of it are, you know, you do get to see the world and you get to see like you know life's bigger than the four walls at home. Exactly, mate. Yeah, exactly. And that, you know what as well. That, that's something I try to kind of tell everyone that I ever meet about joining the military. Yeah. It, it, whether you're pro-military or against military or whatever it is, you know, pro-war, against war or anything, um, there's so much value to be had just from, even if you just do three or four years and leave, there's yeah. just so much value to be mm. had just from that, like yeah. that, that aspect alone, meeting so many people mm. different and dealing with so many situations with people who are different from you, think differently and yeah. you know, all that so. It's just like that 100%. constantly learning thing, isn't it? You know what I mean? You, you know, your mind suddenly put into a position where you're like, you've got to, you basically got to become a better person, or you've got to grow as a person to survive, haven't you? So, yeah. like, you know, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. As in, like, sometimes you you've just got to suck it up and do what the fuck you're told because it needs to be done. Mm. Yeah. And even though you hate it, it's just got to be done. There's and a lesson it, and, in that. Though, isn't yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. There's a lesson in that as well. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to do what's got to be done, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big thing. When I do the motivational speaking, I would hate anyone to leave one of my talks and think, I'm not joining the military, you'll fucking end up at one leg. It's the opposite. I'm like, listen, now I'm a, such a well-rounded person with all this life experience, yeah. all these life lessons. I had a great time. Yeah. And I'm the same as you. I'd say, do it. It's, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. good for you. And that shows some perspective from someone like yourself who's been through what you've been through. Yeah. Oh, mate, to be I, able to say that. Yeah, you know, I, no regrets and live whatsoever. The way you do, yeah, you know? no mm-hmm. regrets at all. So... When you finish in Vegas, mate, I'm sure that's a whole other podcast on its own, Vegas. But, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. but at one point on that, I've never gambled ever since in my life. <laughs> yeah. Literally. It's the only time in my life I've gambled. I went to Vegas, spent all my savings on gambling. <laughs> Not for me. Back, and that's it. I've never gambled again. <laughs> it's probably a good life lesson. Yeah, I've been to Vegas like eight, I think it's eight, no, seven times since. So eight times, including that one. And I've never, never spent a dollar in a casino wow. since. Yeah. You're a better man than me. That takes, some, that takes some discipline. Yeah. Nah, it's not discipline. It's just, I, I know what I'm good at. And I know what I'm bad at. You are not catching me again. If I'm bad at something and I don't enjoy it, I just won't do it again. Yeah. If I'm bad at something and I enjoy it, I'll try. Yeah. yeah. But I went on feeling shit about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nah, it's not for me. Yeah. You know, lovely. Um, where did the course take you after that? Um, so we got back from there and then I went to Cross McGlen. So I did the last tour. I think it was the last tour that the Corps did in Northern Ireland. Mm. Um, 2002. It might have, they might have, four or five commando might have gone out again. I can't remember if they either went out before us or after. But yeah, we we did one of the last tours of of, uh, Northern Ireland Mm. that the Corps did and went down in Cross McGlen, which is like South Armagh bandit country kind of thing. Um, obviously, by the time I went there, it was 2002, it was a lot. There was no, it wasn't really kicking off then, it was pretty peaceful then, thankfully. Um, and yeah, we went there six months there, and again, that, that was a good learning experience, just the, the physicality of, and the, the skills of it, learning to navigate and get mm. across all the countryside and stuff like that. Um, and, and that was an hard one for me as well, because, um, you know, some of my, a lot of my family are from down south in Ireland and um, a lot of them are you know from Catholic upbringing as well and mm. that area is a Catholic area and that me personally I'm I'm of the mindset as well that I, I don't I don't think we should have been in Northern Ireland doing the things for as long as we do I think you know we, years and years way before my time when they went there to try and get a bit of peace between the, the like the factions that were kicking off um Maybe then, but I don't think by the time I was there, I didn't really feel that we should have been just overstayed the welcome. Yeah, I I feel so. I don't I don't really um, I don't know. I just don't. I, I know that if I had soldiers walking around my town, yeah. I wouldn't be happy with it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Does that yeah. put you in? Does that put you in a tough position? Like when you're morally like? Yeah, it does because you've also got to remember then that there is the small sections of those people that that are bombing places or doing mm-hmm. stuff so then on the flip side you've got to think well someone's got to protect that community the greater good sort of thing do you know what I mean but then it, it, yeah it is it's a, it was a difficult situation yeah. you're not not a difficult situation but a difficult like my, you know, thing to get your mind around because luckily like I say it was peaceful when I was there mm. we, you know there's no there's absolutely no kicking off or anything the locals kind of just ignored us or said give us a nod and, all yeah. and that was it so 
happy with that. I, I don't think I would have liked to have been there yeah. in the 70s, 80s, 90s or mm. something like that because that, that, that represents a totally different yeah. um, discussion altogether. That's, it? What, yeah. that's what I think. Obviously, I've got no experience like you lads, but I always think if you get put in a position where sort of like your own thoughts are different to your sort of, you know, your mission, so to speak, or your, or your job posting, how you navigate that in terms of being able to switch on and off, do you know what I mean? Mm. In terms of like, my, my opinion on this might be different to what my job is. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There was times like that for me, just skipping, jumping ahead a bit in Afghan and sometimes yeah. you'd be you'd be on a compound roof and you'd have to get to another compound to be like 200 metres of open ground. <laughs> And it's like you've got to fucking run as fast as you can to that See, one. that doesn't sound a lot when you're talking on the <laughs> podcast, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. like 200 metres of open ground yeah, in yeah. Afghanistan is a lifetime yeah, up there. Yeah. And there's that moment where, you, for me personally, I mean, I just stop thinking like this, but you think, how is me running 200 metres across this field, you know, helping to keep the UK safe? Mm. Like, you know, what is that? And I guess, though, for me, anyway, if, if you think too much into it, yeah. you drive yeah. yourself crazy. So in the end, I, I just kind of listen getting told to go yeah. and go I've read that before like on sort of people who've served and stuff like it's sort of that job mindset it's like right I'm here to do a job and I'll switch on and do a job do you know what I mean mm. but that, that, that that's not easy I don't care what anyone it's not being, yeah. uh, it's funny you should mention that today uh, we might bring this up later but <laughs> but I, I I think um, I don't really um, I don't go for the thing when people, you know, like people say, oh, I'm just doing my job. I don't go for that because mm. you, you, you're, per- you're a man, you're a person, you've got your own choices. And if you don't agree with what you're doing, then you should have the balls to say, I'm not doing yeah. it. it. Whether you're in the military, whether you're in the police, whatever it is, I don't think anyone's got the right to just go, I'm just doing my job. I think that's bullshit, mate. I think you're a person, you make your own deci- decisions and you should be accountable for them decisions. Um, that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That's what, so, that, that's like, any decisions. Me, even at war, would you yeah. just go to far as Afghan and stuff? and. What, what do you mean? For example, in I don't know any experiences of when you were in the court. Is there any times where you've kind of was like, you know what? No, I don't agree with this. Well, I, th- I think you've got to you've got to like you say navigate that then. And if you don't, if you strongly disagree with someone, you make the choice then whether to do it or not based mm. upon your whether you agree with it or not. And if you make the choice to do something that you disagree with, I don't think you can. I'm not saying. Because it's, it's a hard thing to stand yeah. up and say, well, I'm not doing that. Yeah. But then if you, if you do something you disagree with, then you should, you can't then just go and dust him. You've got to be accountable I for that. Yeah. You, should be, uh, yeah. you should be at least be accountable enough to say, look, I disagree with this. I don't do it. But, yeah. or, or, or I disagreed with doing X, Y, and Z, but I still did it and that's on me. Yeah. Do you mm-hmm. get, do you get yeah, what yeah, I mean? Accountability I is, is what, like, basically, you know, having the balls to say, yeah. Like, I think there's been a lot of people with, the, like, the coronavirus stuff, having that with, for instance, the police force. And I, I sympathise with the police force on this because they've, they've been kicked about in the middle of the thing, aren't they? Like yeah. between the government mm-hmm. and the police, uh, the government and the people. Uh, but I do, it, it, with, with that, you know, I, I do think there's, it, like each police officer or each person that's, they, they, they can't, I know what you mean. There was, yeah, no, there was I mean, no kind of like common sense sometimes, was there? Yeah. It was like, oh, it's my job and I've got yeah, to do it. Yeah, I don't think anyone's got the right. To, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Is I don't think you've got the right to say that. You know, if, if you're if you're if you're a police officer and you turn up to do X, Y, and Z because you've been told to, I don't think you get the right to say I'm just doing my job. Yeah, you've got to I be accountable you, and take common sense into it and make yeah, your own yeah, kinds exactly. of decisions or, as well. If you don't, you might not be a strong enough character to be wearing that uniform in the first place. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But I, I really I felt for the the police on this coronavirus yeah thing, I think like, it's, it's sort of like like obviously we'll make the decision at the top end which is government you enforce it for us do you know yeah what I mean? and exactly that, exactly you know, yeah. where, where's the sort of yeah you know the, yeah. The, they're the ones so that the public are shouting back at them like yeah. you're doing this you're doing that was like well, I'm just and I suppose, especially message. in this coronavirus thing because you know what, what I've, I don't try and put any opinions pro or anti against it because again it's just just ends up into an echo chamber and, yeah. and when you you know when you go on social media with them sort of things a lot of the time, nothing, nothing happens. If you, you know, you post like an anti-COVID thing or a pro-COVID thing, whatever you call it, all that happens is the people who agree with you jump on your bandwagon and say, "Yeah, fuck yeah, you're right, bang, bang, mm. bang." The people who disagree with you go, "Nah, you're a wanker, you're wrong." But there's no real dialogue where people no. discuss it and then tell me one time you've actually seen someone have a Facebook mm. argument and, and change their mind. Just noise, isn't it? No. It just doesn't happen. No. So I try and really not to 
post on them sort of things. Yeah, it's a, a wise move, mate, to be honest. Yeah. That's why I like these podcasts, because you can come on and you can and have kind of long-form yeah. debates and say, well, yeah, you know what, yeah. I agree with you on that, but actually we'll have to agree to disagree on it. I think this, in this so. generation, though, the, the, like, the ability to disagree is gone, isn't it? Because, yeah. for example, if you have an opinion, but I disagree, but I say, look, this is my opinion on it, I think as as people, as men, as whatever, you should be able to say, all right, yeah, like, there's... The, Weighing it up this way, but yeah. now it's just like, oh no way, you can't have a different opinion to me. Yeah. It's like, mm. we can still be We can have totally different views yeah. on something. That doesn't mean I think you're a wanker. No. Yeah. We can still be mates. We just you know see I mean? a situation I've a little bit. I've got loads of mates that I've got totally different opinions on, on yeah. certain things. I think with. it's healthy and it's to a certain degree, do you know what I mean? Because if everyone agrees on everything, then mm. it's just a, a cult. It's so <laughs> yeah. funny you say yeah. that as well, isn't it? Because it's like, if you agree, disagree on something, it's like, next, it's like, oh, you should come to me. It's like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least, just because we disagree on I that doesn't probably mean... weird that the thing of people you know I'm, I, I'm probably guilty of it myself especially with Covid and I don't you know I don't have conversations about vaccines about Covid because like in the end I think I'm going to just offend somebody and then after have a conversation that I don't really want do you know what I mean I'm just going to be like yeah. okay well mm. I'll just say yeah you do you do I'll do whatever I do we just leave it well, here yeah, I, I mean I made one post about Covid and it just turned into about fucking <laughs> and it wasn't about it wasn't actually about Covid either it was about the va- like ha- people being forced into having a vaccine if they don't want it kind of thing because mm. yeah. I'm not pro or anti-vaccine neither way I just think people should have the choice yeah, yeah. I'm exactly the, the same the mate, rights yeah. to choose what happens to their own body and I don't yeah. think anybody should have their freedoms taken off and based upon that choice yeah. any more than yeah. someone should have their freedoms taken off and for being obese you know because mm. why you know if someone wants to eat more than they should so what let them you yeah. know it's up to them mm. or, or anything else I believe people should have personal choice in everything. And that's what my post was about. But then... Yeah, it, social media wouldn't it, have yeah, started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's social media going the way it goes. People start to... Yeah. You get people saying like, yeah, you're right, we, vaccine's full of this and that and the other. I'm like, yeah, I wasn't saying that. Yeah. And then you get other people saying, you're a fucking anti-vaxxer. And I'm like, I'm not, I wasn't saying that yeah. either. Yeah. But it wasn't about that. It was yeah. just about... Yeah, you're losing, a, you're losing a fight there, mate, by yeah, time to... Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. I did one post and I thought, I won't do that again. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? so you're falling down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You're, you're right though mate about people in, in those positions though whether it be military or the police you need strong individuals you do that, and, and if we don't mm. we're, we're fucked aren't mm. we? You know, we, do, we do need strong individuals that have got enough moral courage you know, to be able to say yeah. I don't think this is right or I do think this is right is your training based on that then like in terms of building like a strong I don't know, obviously you go to like your physical limits and stuff, but is it is it developed to develop like strong? I mean, I didn't people? I didn't um, serve or, or kind of go up in the ranks as much as Stapes, but um, yeah, just me as a person, mate. Yeah, I felt so much more confidence yeah. in, in my ability to you know read situations and, mm. and be out in a big wild world, in big wide world. But um, obviously, they, I mean, they do always say, don't like in basic training, that a Royal Marine should be a thinking soldier, not just someone who says yes sir, no sir, three yeah. bags full sir, and, and I personally do believe from my time in the Corps that that's what we did try and push. We tried to push people to be thinking soldiers, think for themselves a little bit, not just, yeah. you know, not just ticking box exercises. Mm. Yeah. I, I feel that that's what I got out of my time in the Corps mm. as well, the ability to think for myself and... So important, being, isn't it? And being an argumentative well. wanker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know one thing, mate, I love from, and it, you know what, mate, this genuinely could have been you said this, it could have been one of the PTIs, I don't know who, and I, you know what I loved about the Corps, that this kind of mentality, of you know winning and being the best and i remember we were doing a, a game in the gym and you know like ptis are cheating the day team and stuff like that and um <laughs> one of the ptis went if you're not cheating you're not trying hard enough yeah roger <laughs> <laughs> I was almost gonna say it <laughs> but it's that mentality though like you know winning I and, I, and i think sometimes you know we, we talk about like what's right and what's wrong and oh it's pc and it's this I think that's sometimes that drive to win and mm. fucking win at all costs yeah seems like it goes a little bit doesn't it sometimes mm. in society mm. and one thing when you say about what I took from the core, it was just like this this confidence that it'll be all right, I've, I've got this, I'll think of myself, I'll sort it. And obviously you've sat along with me, went up more in the ranks. I can only imagine it, it grows more and more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny you should mention that as well, because like, since I left the core, I've really got into like the sports psychologist. I read a lot of books on sports psychology and that sort of things. And when I was in the core, like you say, it was all always about winning at all cost. Now what I kind of lean more towards is a more realistic view of you're not going to win everything but as long as you do your best mm. at all costs and can honestly do your best at all costs then you can sit happy right. do you know like if you go into an MMA fight and you you do your best every single day in training camp I don't mean do your best as in win every round I mean yeah. do your best in them minutes in them rounds 
try and apply your technique the best, try and apply your mindset the best. You're not going to win every round. Yeah. And you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes, and that's natural and and it's necessary as well. Yeah. But as long as you know that you've done your absolute best, ticked all them boxes of doing your best, then you compete on the night and you do your best. The result's not in your hands because you might come up against someone who's better than you. Yeah. You might come. You might get caught in a submission that you weren't aware of or whatever it was or. That's sort of what will be, will be. But yeah, the, you, you you cannot control the the result of of a contest, and, and sometimes mm. you can't of any contest, whether it's against PTIs in the core or whatever. But you can't always control. Well, you can never control the result of a contest because there's someone else also trying to win. You know. Yeah. But as, the one thing you can control is the fact that you do your best a hundred percent, not just on fight night, but in your preparation, in the way you're sleeping, the the things you're thinking about, the books you're reading. Do you know what I mean? If you yeah. if you know you've done your best, then the outcome, you're just focusing on the process rather than the outcome. I think that's so important. Like I say, my, my kids are there, not so much my son, but my little girl's five, almost six. And I say to her every day before school, what's the number one thing you need to do today? And she says, try my best. And I say to her all the time, because for me, like, I know we spoke about school, but if, you're, if your best is, if your absolute maximum is someone's, like, absolute least, that's okay, because that's your maximum, do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's no, there's, yeah. although you know the levels to the game is is probably a, you know a, a true statement in all walks of life. But your maximum should be celebrated if you are doing your maximum. The yeah. only sin or whatever should be if you're not doing your best. Mm. If you're just letting things happen. Be- like when recruits join the Marines, you, you all like PTI first day you get them in and blah blah blah. That's kind of it's it's pretty crazy because that. I kind of go back to that speech now. I remember it when I first joined up. My PTI was a guy called Dixie Dean. He's still one of my best mates to this day. Um, and like he brought us all in and he was like, big, like say, big PTI. I was like, fucking hell, who's this? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, he was like, right, lads, you know, some of you are 25 year old fit monsters, blah, blah, blah. Some of you are skinny little 17 year olds fucking blatantly looking at me like that. <laughs> but his point was, he was saying, I'm not bothered if you're the fittest bloke in the troop or the shittest bloke in the troop. I don't care if you come first on every run or last on every run. I want 100% effort off you and I want a good attitude off you every day. And that's it. As mm-hmm. long as you give me 100% effort and as long as you turn up with a good attitude, I'm happy. Even if you fucking, like I said, back of every run, shit on rope, climb, shit at press-ups, as long as you put 100% effort in, you're sweet. Yeah. But if you're the fittest bloke in the troop and you're loafing and you're holding a little bit back, then yeah. you're gonna know about it. Do you know what I mean? I and totally I, agree with that. And I kind of, soon as I heard that from him, I was like, yeah, man, you know, that's what it's about. Mm. And I've kind of tried to live by that all my life now. You know, yeah, because not everyone can be the best at everything. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But no. everyone can. But everyone give can try that. Yeah, yeah, everyone, everyone can, can give. Everyone can give what they've can got. Always give your own yeah. yeah. percent. Yeah. I guess it's better to be around and people who are doing that, isn't it? The, like when I in my MMA career, the fights that I've lost that I've given 100% to everything and I've ticked all them boxes. I've, I've never been bothered about them. Mm. It's the fights where I've lost when I've sat back and think, I could have done this, but not, and it's not always in the fights. Maybe it's in preparation or whatever, you know, when I've been staying up till two in the morning looking at YouTube and shit. And when I've looked back at them and I've thought, yeah. you, you know, e- even fights yeah. when I've won, mate, even fights that I've won and I've looked back on and I've thought, what was it? There's one, one fight in particular, which everyone would think would be one of my favorite fights uh, when I, I fought on Bama and won the, won the world title. And when I look back at the training camp, I'm actually a bit gutted with myself on it because I know I could have done better. Like, I just weren't eating, I was doing so much stuff. I fucking lost a load of weight because I weren't eating properly and I weren't, I was, I weren't focusing on training as much as I should have been. I was trying to, I was going, you know, trying to earn money for my family and stuff like that. And, um, run around run, doing 14 hour days at the gym and stuff like that which really I shouldn't have been doing for them few months um, if you look, if you watch me in the fight I'm like that because I was under so much stress um, and I look back at that fight and even though it was one of the pinnacles of my career in me achievement wise I look back on the training camp and I think I'm, I'm not happy with that because I know I didn't give my own that, I think that just shows you your mindset I mean. though, yeah. Yeah. but there's other fights what I've lost and I thought yeah, that's so what man I fucking did my best mm-hmm. though and I think that's, it's a great mindset that. and personal pride it's like yeah, that, yeah. it's like because obviously when you switch the lights off in bed or whatever at night and it, it's only you you that's know it. what's happened that's, you, it. You know what I mean? yeah. that's it yeah. you can jo- give it you can speak and Johnny shit. Wilkinson's done a thing and he was like you know if on a Monday I put in 100% Tuesday put 100%, 100% Wednesday 100% Thursday 100% Friday 100% the chances are on Saturday I'll probably be 100% whereas if on Monday I'm, I'm at 50% if 
you know, Tuesday I'm at 100, but Wednesday I'm at you know, yeah. 80. Saturday, it's just you're putting out your hand in a bag and picking out whatever, then you don't yeah, know, yeah, do yeah. you? Yeah. And it's yeah. that kind of mindset. Yeah. That's when talent yeah. starts to get separated, I think, because yeah. you know, there's, there's thousands upon millions of people who are talented. It's that when it starts, when it starts plateauing and everyone's yeah. quite good. It's them little inches, isn't it? It's the the people who go to bed early. It's the people who who will eat well on a Saturday and Sunday and won't have you know pizzas and mm. it's just them tiny little. So just as a tiny little example of that, like a relevant example today, this this was literally yesterday. Uh, I won't mention the guy's name right now. Um, he'll know what that I'm talking about, but I don't want to mention it now because in preparation for a fight, um, and this might go out before his fight. <laughs> but like one of my fighters. Um, we'll come in for like we do pro team sparring on a Wednesday and it's obviously pro team it, we, and the way we do we set up quite a lot of pressure you, you, if you're a pro you turn up you might be waiting around for half an hour 40 minutes just like you would be on fight night you know for your for your time in the cage and then when you get in there it's just you stay in for however many three four five rounds whatever you're doing and everyone's around the cage like giving it so it's a little bit of that fight night pressure sort of things and I could just tell by his body language his face and that that he weren't into it that day he was, I could say he was a little bit you could see he, was, he didn't. He looked a little bit flat to himself. Do you know mm. what I mean? But he got in the cage and he put in three fucking rounds and he looked mint. And even between rounds, I could see that he was a bit like <sighs> exhausted. I could see his body language that he was exhausted. And he, you know, he, he weren't. He, but he, he put in some mint rounds and he looked mint. And like I tried to have that chat with him after it about like you know. As long as you put your hundred percent mm. in, sort of thing, because on fight night you might wake up on fight day feeling like shit. Yeah. But you're gonna have to fight. Mm. You can't just go. Do you know what? I'll put fifty percent into there because I yeah. feel like shit. You don't want to do that on fight night because you get strangled in front of your missus and kids. <laughs> yeah. Nice one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. But he did. You know, he felt like shit. I could see in his body language and his face that he was feeling, you know, not feeling himself anyway. Yeah. But he still put fucking a hundred percent into them rounds that he mm. did. He's, he's a hundred percent in, and he come out exhausted. Won every round, looked mint. And then I like afterwards, he was like, "I didn't feel myself today." And I was like, "I know you didn't, mate, but look what you just did. Mm. If you can do that on the days you don't feel great, mm. what can you do on the fit on the days you do yeah. feel great, hundred percent? Because he, he, mate, he was you know aspiring against the world. As champion. a coach, do you think you can teach that, like that attitude or that that? You, you can't attitude. necessarily implant it in someone. Yeah. But you, you can steer them towards it, and you can set the example of it as well, can't yeah. you? You know, if I if I turn up teaching my classes, like I feel like shit. I'm just gonna have an easy class today, lads. Yeah. What's, what example does that set? You know, I turn up to that gym some days, I'm exhausted because I've been training, I've got kids, I've been running around doing my business work as well as coaching. It's a lot, you know, it's a lot of work. Some nights I'll turn up to the gym and I'm exhausted, but you'll never, no one on the class will have and all that because yeah. mm. I won't let them because I will go upstairs, have a quick coffee, look in the mirror and go, let's do it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And I will, I will go and put my 100% into that class. I might yeah. walk af off after it and be exhausted and collapse, you know, <laughs> but no one's going to find that. Is that again back to your days as a PTI? Yeah, 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 100% ball of fire thing. Mm. You know, every, uh, another thing they always say on your PTI course is that when you take recruits on a training session, you should be sweating as much as they are because mm. you should be all over ball of fire, inspiring, motivating, bollocking if they're needing it, pushing and giving a pat on the back if they need it. Mm. And if you're not doing that, why the fuck are they going to do it? Do you know what I mean? Why, why are they going to give 100% if you're not? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think you can necessarily implant that in someone, but you can lead by example and you can do it yourself and yeah. then you can have these sort of chats with people and try and mm. steer them towards that sort of mindset. Uh, but then it's on them to... Apply, apply it. it. Yeah, yeah. So that's what that title is what? all about. Knowing yeah. is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. Yeah. It's a Bruce Lee quote, but that's what that's all about. You know, it's, it's not enough to know something, is it, mm -hmm. unless you're applying it... People yeah. always say knowledge is power, isn't it? Just application is power. You know, yeah. you can know everything you want, but you can read ten books a day. If, if you can't, you've not got the time to apply the knowledge upon them. them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's, worth, it's worth zero, isn't it? You know? You're just a busy fool, then, aren't you? Really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mate, um, before we go, because I know, mate, there'll be loads to talk about on the uh, on the MMA stuff. Um, so your time in the core, did you save in Iraq? Yeah, Iraq, yeah. I was on yeah. the initial, the initial invasion. Was, really? Yeah. yeah, I was on one of the first helicopters over from um, Fort Two Commando. I think Forty Commando landed a couple of minutes before us. So we, we, uh, we were in QA obviously for a few months before, and and then on on the night of the invasion, we were all like lined up in sticks just in the middle of the desert, and obviously all the helicopters had come in, pick you up and go. And I think, I think Forty Commando. Bravo company or Delta 
I might be totally wrong. This is just my recollection. <laughs> <laughs> I might be totally wrong. There's probably lads thinking, you're fucking full of shit. <laughs> Everyone wants to say they were on the first <laughs> helicopter, yeah. don't they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think they landed first in like an ambush position and then we landed a couple of minutes after them in, a, in like in another position. Uh, what was yeah, the feelings of, the, of being part of the invasion? <sighs> Weird, man. Uh, because at that time, don't forget, the British military hadn't really been to war since the Falklands. I mean, they had the Gulf War in '91, but it wasn't. A, it was. It wasn't a real intense war. They, I mean, there was pockets of intensity within. You know, so anyone that served in the Gulf War, I'm not trying to take away from what you did. Obviously, there was pockets of intensity within it, but it wasn't like a real two or three year long, mm. um, you know, thing. So there wasn't really, as much as we like to think there was, there wasn't really a lot of combat experience in, within the British military at that point. Uh, we were kind of making it up as we went along. Um, and it, it was weird, mate. It was weird, the feeling, because, I, you know, I, obviously we all had 100% confidence in ourselves. In fact, we probably had more confidence than we should have had <laughs> in ourselves and our ability. Uh, but at the same time, you're going into the unknown, aren't you? And there's actually no one to ask. Because, hmm. like, nowadays, a young soldier, if they get sent to war, which hopefully they won't do for a long time, there's loads of lads to ask, how, did, how was Afghan, how was this? Or they can <coughs> hit, hit you up on Instagram or whatever, can't they? Like, hmm. lads, I've, I've had a few lads in the court at the moment, you know, in the court at the moment, who've messaged me and said, look, we're going on this op or something in Somalia, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. How did you feel, you know? There's a lot of that experience about it. There was none back then, hmm. so it's like... Yeah, I've no thoughts of it like that, actually. Let's ask one of the corporals, how did he... F ah, he's never done it. <laughs> Right, let's ask the sad. No, no, he's never done mm. either. You know, so there was there was none of that experience really. But I, the the one thing I do remember is when on the when we first flew over there was um, me and a friend of mine, Eddie. We were like rammed into these helicopters. Probably twice as many people as should have been on there. Probably three times as much kit, and it was that bad that like me and Eddie were like we had a little window like this first like this jammed up to the finger like that oh my god and we're just looking out the window like that and there's just tracer rounds from the anti-aircraft guns coming all through the sky everywhere and you're just looking across the sky full of red literally there must be hundreds of anti-aircraft weapons firing up and you're just thinking what well, how the fuck are we gonna fly through that how you know but they did mm. <laughs> they did what's the initial thought like when you land do you know what I mean I mean I know you can prepare yourself and you can go through this training and all this stuff but when you actually land what's the I mean my experience would be different states because I when I've landed in Iraq and Afghan it was all set up and it yeah. was all I mean being part of that is obviously a lot different yeah weird but, I mean for me when I when my experience of Iraq when I went it was super chilled I was in Umkazar yeah the, mate, well we went to Umk we went from Al Thor Peninsula for about a week and then we went to Umkazar yeah. and they, we got told there was going to be loads of resistance there and it was going to be the fucking big war this was going to be the big war and then we got there they'd all fucked off so yeah <laughs> nice. yeah so thank fuck for that yeah. <laughs> everyone's like yeah <laughs> you got there like, oh. yeah my, my time in Iraq was pretty chilled and you know never fired my weapon once in anger so I was never ever any major anxieties or you know from that but one of the big ones which lives with me forever is when we landed in Afghan and the two little stories I first remember from the first few days in Afghan is when we were in Camp Aston and you'd have your meetings of what's going on in the area. There was a couple of uh, parachute regiment lads who, who were sadly killed in a suicide attack at um, the reference point was Blue Door. And they're given this brief and they're saying, lads, this has just happened. And then at the end of it, he says, if anyone, uh, so be wary of this lads, as this happened at Fob Inkerman. And I was like, that's where I'm going. You're going there. And, you know, I've just had a 20 minute brief on, you know, suicide bombing is, is rife at the moment and it's all happening and where I'm going. So I'm thinking, fucking hell. And then the helicopter landed in, in Fob Inkerman. And the door comes down, take all your kit off. You're all kind of pile on the kit while the helicopter takes off. But there was a big line of padders coming in. Now, obviously, we're all fresh faced and, you From know, ready control, to go. Like no, as in they were, we were, they were leaving, you know, oh, the padders. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were taking over from the padders. And these padders, who we obviously massive respect to them, <clears throat> but they got on this helo after doing six months and they looked yeah. like, yeah. you know, they were soulless in their yeah, eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, were gaunt and they were just looking right through you. And, you know, we've got off and we're like ready for our six month yeah. tour. And these lads, you know, very similar to us, similar ages, similar everything. They just look like, you know, soulless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I looked at the base and there was a big hole in the side of the, <laughs> side of the base. 
I've just been told about these suicide bombers and now the lads we're relieving look like shit. And I thought, fucking hell, this is going to be interesting. Mm, yeah, yeah. That no, was I, I, I literally exactly the same. Um, camp, when we, we lamps at camp, camp Juno, which is about a couple of miles up from Bastion, it's like out on its own Juno. Yeah. If you ever, ever went no. there or seen it. Um, yeah, we landed there and the, the lads, they were paras as well. Like I was I was at F Company, so it was like part of what was one para. And they were from, I think they were from Alpha Company or something. And uh, it was exactly the same, mate. When, when we got there, and we had, you know, the lads who were, we were relieving, they just looked, they just looked, fuck me, them lads need a break. You mm. know what I mean? And I was just thinking, then shit. Because uh, it's kind of like looking into, a bit like looking into the future. Looking into the future, yeah. mate, yeah. Is yeah. that going to be me? It's going to be us in six yeah, months, yeah. yeah. I think that's such a... I don't know whether, like, as you say, not that you were naive people, but the naivety of your age might yeah, actually yeah. play in your yeah, favour. Yeah, 100% you know for me. Not just your age, mate, I now. think it's the, just, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And you get yeah. there thinking, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and then you get there and you think, oh, shit, yeah. what the fuck? It's nothing like I expected. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you land with experience, I guess you're like, you know, them, them anxieties and stuff are, yeah. are there and present, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. Like, I went back to, I did the, I was obviously on... What was it called? Optel it, Optel. I was on Optel it one on the initial invasion that stayed there. Uh, I don't know how long we stayed there, uh, four or five months or something. And then I actually got transferred to 40 Commando and I went back there for Optelic four and five, I think it was, in like 2000, end of 2004, start of 2005 sort of time. And like you say, when I went back there then, I was like, I was a different bloke by then. Mm. Totally different bloke because I'd already been there, done it. and. Mm. Being there during it's what what we thought was going to be its worst time, and then when we went back, it was just a lot more confident, a lot more yeah, yeah, different. How, how would you make describe? Because um, <clears throat> again, I was describe it Iraq for me. Never fire me weapon once in anger. Afghan was like the wild west. How would you describe your personal tours of differences in Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, well, very very similar, mate. I think the intensity of Afghanistan is just crazy compared to, you know compared to what went on in Iraq. Um, Obviously, like 2004 or five, they had the, the Shiite uprising down, down in Basra as well, but we, we weren't too much involved with that. We did a few ops like up in Alamara and stuff like that, and we did like a long op up in, I think it was Najaf, right right up north, where the US Marines were taking a lot of a lot of income in the centers up there for a bit. But it was, like you say, it's, I don't think, it's not really like the same sort of intensity. Of, like you say, Afghanistan's the Wild West, wasn't mm, it? You know? Yeah. What herrick did you do when was you out in Afghan? It, uh, I don't even know what herrick it was. It wasn't herrick. It was um, oh yeah, Jakarta, was it? No, it had a yeah. different op name. Oh, did it? it? I was with SFSG, you weren't. I was oh, right, right, okay. Yeah, I think it, it would have been. Well, it was 2010. Oh, so it was. So I don't know what. It yeah. was pretty, pretty yeah, naughty was, out there. Yeah, then. Um, I don't know what. Well, 2009 I think and it 10. Might have been 11 or something like that. 2011. Yeah. Okay. So you were out there what 2010? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's 2009 and 10 were the, well, obviously the deadliest year for um, British soldiers. And I, I had a similar story to you in the sense of I remember being in, in one of the Sangas and one of the old Sergeant Majors, I think it was, or a couple of stripes come running down into the Sangha and, you know, was just kind of so eager to get on the on the point five or the GMG. And I was kind of looking at him thinking, well, you've surely done all this before. And I think what dawned on me was Afghanistan was a whole new kettle of fish. Yeah. It was just... Like you're saying before, you didn't like. Yeah. No one had seen anything like this no, before. I, don't I think. think so. No. What was your? It's such a hard situation at the minute. I mean, when when you look back now on, on Afghan and and everything you've been through, with what's happened the last few days? What are your What are your just initial emotions on it all? Um. Well, I was saying this when I did that Instagram live the other day. I tr try not to have any emotions if I'm honest, because I don't. I didn't lose anything there, uh, apart from my friends, you know. Uh, but. I, I wasn't injured the way you were injured. I wasn't, I didn't obviously get killed out there. Um, I don't live there. I don't feel like I've got the right to have, to get, do you, do you understand what I mean? It's hard, it's hard, I'm hard way to explain it. I'm just trying to look at it from a logical and a point of view and a perspective for the future. Like, like while you're there, you, you know, you're young and you're there for the lads around you, aren't they? You're like, mm. I don't give a fuck what anyone says, queen and country and this, that and the other. I couldn't give a bollocks about the queen at that yeah, point exactly in time, the same. I'm honest. I was there for the lads around me. And um, now I'm a little bit older and stuff, and when I look at it now, I kind of look at it with a more point of view where... I don't live there. I was there for six months. But all the people that are in Afghanistan, they live there, they've got to deal with this forever. 
Do you know what I mean? It's a different perspective now. You know, back in them days, I felt like, okay, now you know, I'm 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 the to fight the war kind of thing. I'm a lot older and more experienced in life now. Um, now I'm just looking at it as a how how is it gonna sh how is the future gonna be shaped for them people? Because I've got kids, you know what I mean, mm. uh, and I wouldn't like my kids to live the way they're living yeah. now. <clears throat> and a, a lot of people who 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 have spent time in Afghanistan and fought against the Taliban and stuff like that might not like what I say because they might still have them feelings of like, fuck the Taliban, let's do this, let's do that. And, you know, I, I, un I totally understand that, totally understand that. But for the future of the bit, them people who live in Afghanistan, us, us people just saying that, fuck the Taliban, this and the other, isn't going to help them. Mm. There has to be some way of helping them find peace. And clearly now the Taliban are in control, whether you like it or not, they are in control. You, you know, there's no two ways about it. So there has to be some kind of way of trying to find a dialogue with them people, with the Taliban, to work out a peaceful future for the people of Afghanistan. If we all sit back and go, fuck the Taliban, let's smash them and do this and do that, what are we gonna do? Have another 20 years of the same stuff and that have them people live through another 20 years of the same stuff. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, while I was there at them times, I didn't have them sort of feelings, you know, but I'm a lot, like I say, I'm a lot older and more experienced now. Mm. Um, I've got kids myself that I don't want to live, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like my kids to be growing up in that kind of thing. <clears throat> what are we going to do? Go back and fuck the Taliban again for 20 mm. years and then the same thing happen again. I wouldn't like that to happen. So I, I just think for the future and then people, you've got to try and look at it and think, we've done 20 years of that, we've given a kind of, the, the, I mean, there's no two ways about it from like 2010 onwards most of Afghanistan was quite a, not peaceful as we know peaceful but peaceful for Afghanistan yeah a lot of people women you uh, were allowed to be educated there's bars and restaurants out there and only the last couple of years there was a, a YouTuber in Lashkagar putting up videos about how he loved his life in Lashkagar and stuff and he was going around the like the bars there not natural bar boozing bars and that but you know like what they call just in like the, the shisha things and yeah all yeah stuff. yeah which they never had before mm. and he was saying how they love it now because they've never experienced that in the past and blah 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 and so it's clear that a lot of the people in afghanistan do enjoy them sort of freedoms and security it doesn't mean they enjoy a western kind of democracy and we should i don't i don't believe we should keep trying to push that on them because it's failed so far now um but we do need to have some sort of dialogue with the Taliban, whether we like it or not, because like I said, they are in control now, whether we like it or not, my feelings on them I don't, are irrelevant. My feelings on that don't come into it. I've got no right to make a judgment on it. It is what it is. Um, and for the future of that country and then people, we do have to start some lines of communication with the Taliban now, because they are in charge. Hmm. And hopefully the younger generation of Taliban that are out there, I've seen, because don't forget them, them there's, people in the Taliban as well that are 20 year old and they've seen the last 10 years of relative relative peace, relative calm. So hopefully they've seen that and they've seen that the people want some of that as well. Mm. Um, so hopefully that they stick to their word. Now, whether they will or not, I don't know. I mean, history tends to repeat itself, doesn't it? I think, mate, you've got a very wise... Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, it's like logic versus... Yeah. I hope any like bootnecks out there or any, any military people out there that have them sort of strong fuck the Taliban feelings that understand the way I'm saying that and I'm not saying that as in a way that I think we achieved a lot out there I, yeah, you know, I, I like, I like the idea mate of kind of you know it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved before it's like we, we've gave them you know their freedoms like you say you know they've had they, they've experienced life and hopefully that gives them the fire to think you know what we can let, let's speak to the let's create like you say create a dialogue and yeah can we not get back to something rather than... And ho know. hopefully the old Taliban, and, and again, I'm not saying this is likely to happen. I'm saying hopefully it happens. Hopefully the old Taliban now see that there is a lot of the population of Afghanistan mm -hmm. that do enjoy that level of security and freedom and that they are willing to help them 
and provide that for them. If they're going to, if, I said again, I said this the other night. But if you're going to stick the hat on and say I'm now the government, then you've got to govern the people the way they want to be governed. And if they want security and freedom, you have to provide them with that. So hopefully, and again, I don't, I don't know what the future holds, and I've never in the last 10 years gone and had a chat with a fucking Taliban so I don't know but hopefully they stick to the word on um, that you know they've been saying there's going to be no revenge on people they're going to they're going to mm. let women be educated and stuff like that and they're going to look for peace I hope that they stick to that I don't know if they will but I hope that they do I think that's the thing that I, mean, I, haven't, I speak about Afghan every day when I do the motivational speaking and I've never really cried about it or nothing I'm a bit like you just put it to kind of one side and uh, you know that's what I've done a, a long time ago Mate, and I couldn't stop crying the other day, which was really weird for me. And I think it's because, like you say, you have you've got kids. You know, I've got a six-year-old, and I, I was just getting sad about, you know, the future of like these young children. And again, it was just the sadness of just, you know, if, if the kind of fear of the unknown. Mm. And it was a weird emotion of just feeling sad and knowing that you can't do anything about can't it. It's done. It's yeah. you know, it was just a frustration of sadness and. Probably that was the only way I can describe just a, a sadness, really. Well, that's what that's exactly what you're saying when you're saying you can't do nothing about. It. That's what that's what I, the point I try and get across is about the Taliban being in control now. Like whether there's we no like it or not. There's no point in harboring this anger. Mm. Yeah, because it's there's no point in denying it because they are. Mm. And we can't just do another twenty years of the same thing for it to happen again. We've got to now try and find a peaceful solution somewhere. Mm. Um, I don't know what that the answers are. By the way, I'm not trying to fucking sit here and say I know. Let's do X, Y, and Z. I ain't got a clue. I'm a fucking MMA coach. What do I know? But um, someone who gets paid a lot more than me has to go and try and find mm. a peaceful solution now because mm. the military solution hasn't worked so far. It or not that it hasn't worked. It provided. It worked for a time. Didn't yeah, it? it worked for. It provided a buffer time of security security freedom and um people it could provided a buffer time for people to be able to go and live their lives there where they they mm. wanted to live it now we now that they, it, that's kind of come to an end it's not been time wasted at all and you know people that are saying like oh i feel you know if people say like all oh, the we, lads have lost their lives out there for nothing they absolutely didn't because they provided that you know my, my, to, Two of my close friends died out there, and and their lives didn't get wasted. They helped to provide that level of security and freedom for the time period that it was provided, and hopefully, hopefully, that will now translate into the future, a better future. I don't know if it will or not. I'm not like I say, I'm not. I'm mm. a crystal ball. I guess it's it, for me. Like when I look at it, you know, I've got no experience now, but I feel like you have to judge a situation on now. Do you know what I mean? You have you to gotta look for solutions, yeah, not so, problems. So you can't judge the situation on how it was, you know, 20, 15, 10 years ago. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You sort of, and if you do keep going back to that, you guess you're just gonna go in this vicious cycle. Circle, yeah. So it's it's more about like looking and being like, right, what can we do now to make just judge this situation for what it is now? Do you know what I mm. mean? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I guess yeah, that's exactly. hard, but it's hard to take emotion out, isn't it? It's very hard, especially mm. for like I mean, you sat there talking about this for me is like fucking. Yeah, it's me. Yeah. sticking up because yeah, you, you, yeah. you lost a limb out there, you know. You, yeah. a, you, you, you suffered a lot yeah. more from it than I did, you know. Yeah. So, me talking about it in front of you is like. That's what I don't like. I don't like, yeah, I don't like the noise from outside, do you know what I mean? Because everyone's got an opinion on something that only very few people actually have an experience of. And yeah. That's what's annoying. Mm. I mean, I've, I think my mindset might be different if I've. I've, I've, I've if what's happened to me has happened, then I've kind of made. I've took with it and ran with it and made life for myself. So I'm not. Maybe if I hadn't, I'd be more bitter. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm very grateful for my life, and I wouldn't change a thing. Um, and and obviously there is a lot of lads that that, that have come back from Afghanistan that are that, that are not in as as um, as kind of a, a healthy mindset as as me and you clearly clearly I've got um, because of the the things that they did out there and, and the the injuries they suffered. Whether them injuries are physical or mental, there's a lot of lads that suffered out there that will probably watch this and listen to what I'm saying and think, you fucking wanker, why, you know, why are you saying that? And and I, I, and I just hope they understand that I'm not saying, I'm not saying like, let's fucking high five the Taliban for one minute. I might like, fuck, you know, but what I'm saying is that we are where we are. And like you said, we have to judge the current situation on how it is now. And we have to look for a solution for the future rather than focus on the problems of the past. Yeah. And hopefully there can be a solution. Yeah, Again, I'm not saying there's gonna be. But I'm saying hopefully there is. Anyone that can hope for a better future. Yeah, 
if you can't hope for a better future, then what can you? It's a choice, do? isn't it? It's, yeah. it's either you know you be negative about it or you hope that yeah. the outcome's positive. And as you say, you can't guarantee it will be. But no. what's the difference in saying right? This it's going to go to shit and everything's going to go back to twenty years ago and you know loads of people are going to die and this stuff. Or being like, well, maybe it could mm. go the opposite way. Do you know what I mean? I'll, I'll yeah. try, yeah, try yeah. and actually find ways yeah. to make it go and shape shape it that way. Yeah. You know, for for the people that are above us and and this is the thing as well. Those people that are in government now. And that they do write British policy, foreign policy, and all that now. Their job now is to make sure that our time didn't go to waste. You losing a limb out there, that wasn't a fucking waste. My mates dying out there, our mates dying out there, wasn't a waste. It's, it's their job now to make sure. And they have to do that by trying to create, find a peaceful solution. It's their job. They have to do that now. If they don't do that, then they've let us down. Yeah, they've let absolutely. everyone down. You know, they have to do it. It's great point, mate. Yeah, sorry, mate. That, that was a fucking mate. You've nailed it with that point. It is on. It is on the it's politicians, on them, mate. Yeah, yeah, they have to do. They owe it to us. They owe it to everyone who served out there. They owe it to the Afghan civilian population because I'm sure ninety percent of the civilians out there didn't want a war for twenty years. No. You know, I'm not. I don't mean. I'm not saying that as in like uh, we shouldn't have been there in the first place. Not, I don't think that at all. I think we should have been there and we should have created that buffer of yeah. security that we did create. But now it's on the politicians and to, to, to find that peaceful solution for the a peaceful pathway for the future. Yeah, couldn't agree more, mate. Genuinely. Mate, when you've um, you've got back from Afghan, mate, you've obviously been in the court a while now, you've done Northern Ireland, Iraq, Afghan, successful um career as a as a PT. You mentioned before you were getting into the cage fighting and stuff. When did you start thinking about a career outside the core and taking MMA a bit more serious? Um so I was like um I think four and one. So I started fighting pro MMA while I was still in the core. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. I was like four and one pro while I was. I think I had. I think I think I had about six or seven semi-pro fights while I was in the core. And then talk I, to me about the landscape. Mate, of I actually fought, I fought on Cage Warriors as well. Yeah, I I've just core. got. I got. I got your actual <laughs> record over here. Yeah, Cage Warriors enter enter the rough house. Which uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, I was still in the core then. You're four and all. <laughs> I think I, I can't remember what my record was when I left the core, but it was about four or five and one, somewhat along mm. them lines. And it was just like um, I went on the Ultimate Fighter while I was still in the core. Again, the guy we were talking about earlier, Pete Jordan, and a bloke called Sean Lur. Well, uh, Sean runs a good Instagram page as well. If anyone wants to follow him on yeah there. I follow Sean actually yeah. Yeah. yeah top guy so he, he was like our boss he was like the uh, PTNSO so he was the, like the top PTI officer absolute legend of a bloke again mate my time in the goal so lucky to have a bloke like yeah. him as, in charge but them two were just we, we, <coughs> like, I got told like uh, yeah you can't go on that ultimate fight thing you can't have eight weeks off paid and fucking go on TV and all that and they were just both like you go we'll deal with it <laughs> So that's literally what we did. I fucked off and did it. And them two dealt with the backlash. <laughs> and then when I come back, the, the core was happy with the way I'd represented the core and all that. And they were like, yeah, it's sweet, no worries. So uh, what was that experience like going on that for eight weeks? Weird. Weird, yeah. Because obviously as a boot neck, you're used to living with a, a big bunch of lads, aren't you? But you're not used to doing it in a professional athletic way. You're used to doing it in a in a... What's it like in the core? You know, See, when you're living with ten lads in yeah. the in the rooms, it's all about who can do the most outlandish, fucking craziest shit, bid yeah. biggest bravado, run the fastest, do this and do that, and <laughs> get on the pace and still be the fastest. But obviously, there it's not. It's like you got to be professional. So a little bit, it was like, the fuck do you mean? You obviously we can't, we can't shoot each other with fucking BB <laughs> guns all day. <laughs> 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 I'm not allowed to put holes in my mate's legs with the beagles. What the fuck are we doing here? This is shit. But, um, but yeah, so obviously I did that. And then um, I'd done that while I was still in the core. And then I kind of... Well, I got back from that and then I went to Afghan. You know, af after that. Hell. Yeah, that was after that. Wow. Uh, how mad's that? <laughs> <laughs> when you think back on it. At the time it was weird because it was just I was going with the floor doing whatever I think. But one minute I'm on a reality TV show in fucking America the next minute I'm <laughs> <laughs> in Afghan <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah we've done that and I got back from Afghan and at that point it was like I did feel like I'd done everything I wanted to do in the core um, I felt like you know I'd done a couple of Iraq tours Afghan I'd done Lord of Norway's all that's a couple of Americas done all the mountain training I'd done loads of good stuff in the core over my 12 years and I'm one of them people who thinks like I'd rather leave with good memories than bad. And you know yourself, you have lads who like start leaving, and by the last 
year or so they like fucking hurt this is shit and all that. Mm. I never wanted to be one of them. And I just knew I loved MMA. Um, and also because I'd had <coughs> a few pro fights, I was getting to the point where I was gonna start, I was starting to fight against other fighters that were full-time professionals. So it was kind of one or the other at that point. It was either, I can't be a half committed professional fighter because I'll just lose every fight and yeah. look like a fucking idiot and I'll be not doing my best like we spoke about earlier. Um, so it was either give up MMA and stay in the core or give up the core and do MMA. And um, I felt like I'd done everything I wanted to do in the core. There's loads of lads done miles more than me, by the way. You know, I've, I've done a scratch on the surface compared to some of my mates, you know. But I just felt like I'd personally got enough from the experiences and I wanted to get out in there. And um, I hadn't done what I wanted to do in MMA. So professionally wise. Did you have any regrets at any point when you'd left and was going full time MMA that you'd made the wrong decision and leaving or? Nah, I, I don't think, I don't, nah, I've not got any regrets. Um, I, I try not to think about things like that again. Mm. I try to focus on solutions. Yeah. Like focus on the future and that. But, um, Cause that, I'm just thinking it must have been mad. Was there a point when you, you, you've gone in this secure job? Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's... And then you're like, right now I'm a pr professional yeah, fighter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's that, mate. I mean, there is that, obviously. Like, you, you I think that'll be just as fucking scary as getting in a cage. Well, it went, yeah, because obviously, like you say, you went from a, a, a secure job where you know you're getting... By that time, I've been in 12 years, so I had a, quite a decent salary coming in and I've got mm. a young family and all that. So all of a sudden, running your own business from... Starting your own business from scratch and being a fighter from, you know, pro fighter is like they ain't a guaranteed penny. No. Um, so, yeah, that I mean, that was... I wouldn't say it was ever a regret because, again, I've learnt from that so much from that now um but it was yeah it was scary like doing that you know i guess you, when you started as well like for the general population it was still cage fighting wasn't it like it, it didn't have the obviously in chile it was mixed martial arts but obviously mixed martial arts now is a global thing and people love it and see it for what it is but i guess at that point it was still like a bit outlawed wasn't it like in terms of you know it only goes down in certain areas and stuff yeah it was very it was difficult to get fights like yeah. my first fight was down in plymouth i think it was yeah and obviously i live in rochdale <laughs> so you know that, that tells you how difficult it was to get fights back in them days um i think by the time i started I can't, what, what I kind of th think in MMA is there's like three generations as so far. I think there's the first generation was like, you know, your Ian Freemans, your fucking Lee Remedios, your Butlin brothers, them guys who like were f fighting before anyone even had a clue what was going on, yeah. you know. And they created a little bit of a, you know, they got enough of the ball rolling, enough momentum going for people like me to go, well, that's pretty cool, to see it. Yeah. Because yeah. when they were doing it, no one was even seeing it. It was yeah. in the sports hall, in the fucking school hall, and there was no recording mm. of it or nothing. It was just a fight and, you know, it was what it was. But they created enough of, of a momentum behind it for, for guys like me to look at it and think, fucking hell, I fancy a bit of that. Yeah. And then my generation kind of, because it got so much popular, kind of then help with that momentum and now the third generation is what it is now if you look at the guys that are coming through now yeah mate some of my amateur guys on the first amateur fight would have wiped the floor with me on my first pro fight the level has just gone like yeah. that now you know one of my amateurs yesterday he's had one amateur fight and yesterday he's bad i think he did three five minute rounds with jack cartwright who's a pro cage warriors world champion and you know, and he done well. You know, he don't. Uh, Jack come up to me after the spars and go, "Fuck me, he did well him." And that just shows the yeah. level it's gone at. You know, if I, like, if I was Trent is the kid I'm talking about. If I was when I made my pro debut, Trent's on his second amateur fight now. He would have wiped the floor with me on my pro debut. Do you yeah. know what I mean? The level's just gone like that, and I think that's what this third generation has brought mm. to it. You know, it's like that development of the sport. Yeah, because I'm guessing like. You know, as you said, the second generation, it was like lads who could box, but you know, then went into the cage and, and took all the other martial arts as they came. Yeah. But now you're sort of getting kids Mixed who, who can just do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. mm. I've said it to you before, train ninjas, aren't they? Like they can literally yeah. do the yeah. every yeah. every aspect of martial yeah. arts. They, they, you know, they're working on it every day. Yeah, yeah, I, and and that's the thing with this third generation, this new generation, how good people are getting. You have to be working on it every day. Yeah. You can't be a three day a week fighter anymore. Do you mm. know what I mean? You can if you want, you can try, but that's <laughs> the luck to you. Because there's guys doing two a days now. Mm. You know, there's guys from, from, there's amateurs who've had two fights that are doing two a days. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the amateurs of... that are training like 
pro world champions. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? The level has just gone. Like and although that. the UFC is obviously the top, you watch like you know the likes of Cage Warriors or Bellator and stuff like that, which are like I guess maybe a step below or whatever. The the level in them is yeah. just skyrocketing. Especially Cage Warriors. Yeah, the popularity in it is skyrocketing. I mean, I, just... I feel like Bellator is kind of a two tier organization. Yeah. Some of the like the top tens and the guys who are fighting on the big cards in the states yeah. are, are like obviously top level. I feel like a lot of the European cards and stuff like that. Are, they do put a lot of ticket sellers on them just yeah. to, sell, to fill seats and, and that sort of thing um, against good guys you know what I mean Bellator's a great organisation but it is kind of a two tier thing but K, like you say Cage Warriors yeah. man if you get a fight on Cage Warriors it's a fucking fight that organisation is yeah. look at how many guys they've sent to the UFC I think they've mm. sent some like 100 it's like a conveyor belt isn't it so oh, like, mate. obviously just locally you know obviously Molly and Paddy and them they yeah. all come through that thing legit and mate it's just ran, it is like a conveyor belt I guess isn't it for, yeah. the, for the, the next like generation of UFC fighters it, yeah, for Europe. me if, if you're a European fighter Cage Warriors for me mm. is, is like the you, you know a lot and, and they might not like me saying this you're not going to get paid as much on Cage Warriors as you're going to get paid on Bellator it is what it is mm. um, but if you want to test your metal and you want to test your skills and you want to ultimately be the best and get to the UFC, then that cage worries is that testing ground, isn't it, man? It's just. I guess it comes down to stock as well, doesn't it? I guess if you're getting to the UFC and you you know you've built up this really good record in cage worries, mm. it's sort of one then for like like this guy's done a decent apprenticeship, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this guy's yeah, yeah, done a exactly. decent apprenticeship, yeah. They're probably ready to step in. Yeah, yeah. I oh, guess it's yeah. investing for the future, isn't it's it? Some of the some of the. Do you see the joint card they did UFC and cage worries? I think it was on lockdown. Did he, yeah? Mm. Yeah, so it was like... Um, I think what happened is... Have seen was, you on them trilogy fights? Yes, yeah, so it was something yeah. like that. I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I might not be fully accurate in what I say here, so don't jump down my neck if you're on MMA fanboy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a detail wrong. <laughs> Wankers. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think it was something along the lines of UFC... One of the UFC Fight Island shows got cancelled or something, and they had some European fighters that was because of the COVID lockdowns and all that couldn't come over. Mm. So they asked Cage Warriors to put them fights on. Oh yeah. So Cage Warriors held three fights of UFC guys. Obviously UFC still paid them and all. Yeah, that. yeah, but they just got the but, outing. Yeah, they they put it on the Cage Warriors card, but it was UFC contracted fighters, so it was like a joint sort of venture sort of thing yeah. between the two organisations. And if you watch that card, the Cage Warriors fights were better. Mm. If mm. anyone gets chances to watch that fight, that, that card, it'll, it'll be on Fight Pass or something. The Cage Warrior fights were fucking mo like a higher mm. level than the, the UFC fights that were yeah. on there, and it just showed you like how how good Cage mm. Warriors yeah. is, how good the, the fighters they put on there. Like Ian Dean's a mate of mine who's like the the matchmaker there, and he won't he won't match a fight on that main card unless it's a fucking mm. legit fight. You know I think what that's I, mean? the, I think MMA in general. We've spoke about this. That's the strength of MMA, isn't it? Mm. It's like it, the, the matchmaking is so tough mm. and like. You know, you you either I guess it's like a sim, sink or swim thing, isn't it? Yeah. And you know, there's there's other you know boxing and stuff where you can be protected a little bit. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the, the, I I see why that is as well because they want to. I mean, you, you get some like box like pro boxers who might be like twenty and all pro boxer prospect coming up, but then when you look through the record, he's only had one real fight. The rest yeah. of them have been tin cans that he's knocked over. Mm. And I see the ne reason behind that as well because the promoters are trying to get him up the card to make him more money in the future and make a star of him. You know, I I understand mm. that, and it's not all done with. You know, people. You do get a lot of people saying, "Oh, it's all corruption in boxing." It's not always about corruption. Um, it's sometimes it's about just trying to make a star of that mm. young, young man. Protecting a commodity, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, trying to make that young man a star, and make mm. him some of his life. You know. Uh, well, you don't get that in MMA. <laughs> in MMA, it's like fucking front to the wall. I mean, you fight, yeah. I mean look, look at Reese McKee. He got yeah. signed to the UFC on like a week's notice. Oh, he comes at Chev. Yeah. You know what I mean? Ooh, Did he have one? He had one fight after that, didn't he? And then he, I think he's back at Cage Warriors now. Yeah. But again, yeah. he had another, both yeah. fights. He had were fucking yeah. mad fights. So the guy like, he fought, Hamza Chimaev. He's had, he's had a bit of a, an ordeal with COVID, but you know he's like the. In many people's opinion, like the second coming, you know what I mean? Like, that he's yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah, going to dominate the welterweight division. And Reese McKee got, I think he got five days or something like that. Went in and fought Get, that guy, yeah. and he, he went for it as well. Yeah, of course, he did, he, yeah. He got beat, but, but and again, he, that, that's 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 a guy who understands MMA. Mm. Reese McKee is a guy who understands MMA, he understands that there's opportunities been presented to him. Yeah, he's not going to get an easy fight in the UFC, and he's just gone, yeah, fuck it, I'll do that. Well, he's he's given his best, yeah, what well, he's, he's got done his best, like. 
you know, the next time an opportunity comes up, you know, because he took that, maybe, you know, that, well, Reese McKee took it that time, you might take it this mm. time, then you might win and, you know, change your life. But. Hey, as well on that, I, was, I, I met Reese McKee last week over at uh, Fights in Belfast, and what a nice guy, he took a few pictures with one of my young lads who was over there, oh, I was over 15, yeah. so nice one for that, Reese, mate, top, absolutely yeah. legend of a bloke. Mate, at what point in your fighting career did you kind of think, because obviously what you'd achieved, at what point when you were fighting did you think, was coaching always? Yeah, I, I was. I, if, if I'm honest, I started coaching same time as I started. Like I, I started coaching as soon as I left the court to go pro fighting as well. You know. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, coaching is like my main passion in life. I, I enjoy coaching more than enjoying my own fight career. Mm. You know. I, that, it, That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a weird and it's a weird thing to say because a lot of the time, and this is a mistake I made in my career, right? Because a lot of the, when you speak to people, they say, "No, as a fighter, you've got to be selfish. Think about you, number one." And, put yourself first and all that but I've never done that because coaching is my main love and a mistake I made is I I, I, I listened to them voices of people saying that and, and, and I tried to even though I never did even though I never did that I always put coaching first I always tried to think to myself no you've, you've got you should be more selfish you should be doing this and then like when I sat back a couple of years ago like really evaluating my MMA career and all that and then I thought, well, why, why, why the fuck am I listening to what other people say? I've never do that in anything in life, so why mm. am I listening to them in this? And since I've stopped doing that, or listening, and, and since I've put I put more effort into coaching now than I ever have, and my game's evolved more than it ever has, because I'm doing more of what I actually love and enjoying my time more, my days more, than I ever have. Mm. So my game's evolving, I'm getting better faster mm. than I ever have. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, you know, and, and here's the thing, like I'm not trying to get to the UFC anymore. A few years ago I was, you know, but not not anymore because even if, even if, I'm not lying, you know, if they, if they offer me a contract tomorrow, I'll, I'll turn it down because for me to do that, the commitment it would take for me to be in the UFC and put the proper, put my best work in to do them cards and the promotions and stuff like that, I'd take me away from my family and my coaching. Yeah more than I want it to, you know, I, I'm competing now for the enjoyment of competing, because I do love competing still, yeah. um, and I'm doing it now for, for it's, it's not, it's not. if I, if someone rang me now, I've said, I said this on another podcast a while back, someone rang me and said, uh, we've got a UFC contract here for you, I, I'd be like, well, I'm fucking in my late 30s, man, what am I going to do with it, I've nearly had 30 fights, but I've got a young lad here, Antonio Sheldon, who's ready for it, give it him because mm. he can do something with it he's like six fights in he can make mm. a 20 fight career out of it I'm not going to because I'm not having 20 more fights such you know? a presence of mind I don't like just speaking to you though I feel like you're probably born to like to coach and teach do you know what I mean yeah I, I do I, yeah. I, I feel that's what my calling is yeah. I don't think my calling is to be the best fighter in the world but I can certainly try and help other people yeah. to be it's some record though what did you say 30 fights uh, almost 30 yeah I think I've had 27 pro fights or something yeah Oh, I can't yeah, imagine, I've got some good names like Sodom Bach, Donovan Desmond, yeah. glad you were still yeah, going yeah, now. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, it's not like you were you were operating against low level nah, opposition. I've, I've never fought anyone with a negative record. Not once. Check mm. through my record. I've never fought That's anyone brilliant. with And this is here, for everyone watching MMA at, at home, this is how you know if your local fighter's legit or not. Look through his record. <laughs> and if all his opponents are like 0 5, 0 and 10, oh he's not legit. <laughs> Simple <laughs> as that. If you look through my record, I've never fought anyone who had a ne ne negative record ever. So they've all you know, all my opponents have been good guys. So obviously your world title come on Bama, which is no longer going, right? Yeah, I think Bellator bought it. Yeah, out. they bought it. I think so. Yeah, and Something took like the Ross level. I think so. Yeah. yeah, that that again, Bama was one of these sort yeah. of yeah. yeah European things. But that's it was something. like Bama and Cage were yeah. like neck and neck yeah. at the time, and then yeah, Bellator bought okay, Bama and Cage were just yeah. elevated the game again from there, aren't they? That's some achievement though, becoming like obviously yeah. having a career, then having a career, and re also reaching a very very high standard at that. That that's not something that everyone does. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah I've had two, two pretty mad careers. Yeah. And uh, you're not, you're not exactly old, do you know what I mean? No. Yeah, you think I am mate? pretty old though, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. yeah but <laughs> to, to if someone had said, though, mate, I mean, how many years from being an Afghan was you, you know, your world title? Five. Like that's fucking, mm. that's mad. To think you had well, a no, successful four career four in a really, yeah, four and a half. Yeah, four and a half. Successful career in a core, and you go pro fighter, and you, you know. Yeah. Was that the ambition? Was it to join, become an MMA fighter and fight, fight for the world title or was it to become an MMA fighter and just like sort of see where it took you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so when I, when I left the court, the, the, the total intention was to um, try and become a world champion and try and be the best in the world. And like like I was saying earlier, as as I've 
the more my career has progressed, the more I've realised that my, my my main love is coaching. That that's not really my my thing. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I had a little chat with uh, Joel McColgan last week, and I said I'm still coming after that Cage Warriors belt, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what a good guy he is as well, mate. Because uh, there's no one ever won the Bama and Cage Warriors belt. Yeah. Uh, world titles before. I know Stevie Ray won the Bama British title and the Cage Warriors world title. Yeah. But there's no one that's won the both world titles, and no one can. Because Bama's gone, yeah, yeah. so I still want to win that can with that Cage Warriors <laughs> world title. But like I say, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm I'm not trying to be the best fighter. Like I'm not trying to get to the UFC anymore and win a UFC world title. But back in the day, that's what my ambition was. Yeah, but uh, look, things change as your life. Yeah, of course. What, what was, was it like winning the world title? Um, I don't know, mate. At the time, I didn't really think of it that 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 much. I was obviously I was buzzing for it and everything like that, but. Um, it didn't really sink in, if I'm honest, you know. It's one of them you sort of look back on, I guess. Yeah, I think when you when I look back at it, I think the and it, it's not just the achievement that I'm just glad I did it at the time I did it because um, uh, my, my, my coach Carl Tanswell, uh, he's not with us anymore, and it, but he obviously he coached me f through them years and, and I won a world title with him, and he, he's no longer with us. So I'm just glad that I I was able to do it at that time period because I've got mm. them. Uh, I've got that experience with him, the memories with him, you yeah. know. Yeah. You hear that so much in combat sport, you know, for something that's so, you know, like, people will look at it and be like, oh, it's two men or two women, like, knocking the hell out of each other. But it's sort of the ties that, that come with it. Just yeah, yeah. Amazing, yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, 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 totally, mate. And that's, that's a lot of what it is for me as well. Yeah. That, that, like you said about joining the core, when you see him as a group of men, you think, fucking hell, I fancy a bit of that. That's yeah. kind of what, a lot of what it is for me with MMA. I like to have that. Is, is the goal now then to become a coach of a world UFC champion? Is that the... Y yes and no. I mean, I, I don't want to be one of them coaches who says like, I, I want to be the... How do I say this? I don't want to be a coach who's like, says, I want to be a coach of a world champion because it isn't about me. Do you know what I mean? I want to be the best coach that I can be to, to try and help the other lads follow their dreams. And if someone has five fights... And they do their best, and that's the that's what they achieve out of it, and that improves their life. And then they retire. I've done my job. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Just yeah. as much as if someone wins a world title, that five fights for yeah. that guy might mean the same as the world title mm. does for that guy. So, yes, of course, that's what I want to do is is like help people go as far as they can in the sport. But at the same time, I don't want to be the, the guy who says I want to win. I want to. Because I don't want to just have world champions. That's obviously that'll be a beautiful dream if I if I win someone if you know if I get someone to the UFC and win a world. So you know I'm good friends with John Kavanagh and he's obviously was Connor's coach and you know he's coached someone to be the first ever double champion. What an amazing feeling that must be, and I would love to be able to replicate that. Mm. But it's not my only goal. My own, my main goal, or should I say, my main goal is to use MMA the way it's been used for me to improve your life to. to to, to make some of your life to feel that you've challenged yourself mm. in some ways and it's that positive yeah. impact though isn't it on people yeah, exactly mate that's the main yeah. goal of it yeah. it's like what we were speaking about at the start where you know teachers won't yeah. some teachers will have a positive impact but you could you know you could keep coach someone for three training sessions and then them take what you've learnt, t taught them and go somewhere else in life but still use that you might never know do you know what I mean yeah, but yeah exactly it's mate it's about yeah. having a there's, a, there's a guy we call Jim Turrell who um, he works for Manchester City and I go in to do talks for them and when he does his presentation he uses an example of uh, Phil Foden who went on plays for Man City's first team and another lad who um, got offered a pro contract at 18 said no to it and joined the Marines weirdly enough and and he says you know who am I most proud of both of them I couldn't yeah, yeah. I can't I can't differentiate mm. because they both done what they wanted yeah, to do exactly, and applied man. themselves and the best and one's a marine and one's playing for Man City and yeah. he said I speak to them both and I'm, I can't decide mm. who I'm most proud of yeah. and that's what it's about it, yeah, mate that's exactly what my point is though. Mm. It's like yes coaching a world champion is something I'm striving for but the main goal is to uh, just yeah. coach these my students and my people to, mm. to to achieve what they want out of it. It's not it's not for me to tell someone that you've got to be a world champion. Yeah. You should be my world champion. That that makes it about me then. Mm -hmm. and it, coaching should never be about you. It I think it's be so me. important. Like I want both my kids. I don't know whether I want me both my kids to compete, but I want both my kids to. Like I never train combat sport at all. Yeah. But I want both my kids to to some degree because of what you're saying there. What it sort of 
it can teach so much yeah. about life, not yeah. just not just about you know choking somebody out or being the toughest guy in the room or the toughest girl in the room, but it can teach so much about life, like yeah. you know, little things like not judging a book by its cover, yeah. you know, looking yeah, at someone yeah. and going, and then oh, can you know, <laughs> wrap it up? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? I use this guy as an example quite a lot, but I've got a lad called Ryan Potter at my gym. He's like one of our blue belts, you know. I think he weighs fifty one kilos. He's like tiny, he's like that. But if you judge him on his size, <laughs> he will fucking strangle you, mate. Yeah. That guy is legit, he's, he's a killer, mate. He, his jit, his jits yeah. is like amazing and he's so composed in there. He'll fight, you know, he'll, he'll grapple guys, 90 kilo guys, they're almost twice his body weight, do you know what mm. I mean? And he'll just be composed and he will strangle them. He will strangle them, man. Yeah, you judge a book by its cover, mate. You come up against a guy like him, you'll It's life's great you'll equalizer, it. isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> <mate>. <laughs> Yeah, on that note, mate. That last great equaliser is a burger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mate, on, uh, on that note, and, and Jordan's uh, well more adept to speak about this than me, but who, who are your big kind of, who's exciting at the moment on the UK MMA scene? Exciting on the UK MMA scene. Um, I know just in Liverpool, mate, it's, it's driving at the minute. I was just going to say, there's, there's, so, there's so many. Like with, with Darren, Paddy and, um, and Molly going out to Vegas now, I mean, everyone's buzzing about that. I mean, yeah. who are your kinds of, who have you got your eye on at the moment? What, what, on the big, like on the UFC sort of scene, e Either, or either or. Who should we be kind of keeping an eye out for? Uh, well, obviously, all my fight, I've been mega biased and say all my fighters, so I won't do that. Um, <laughs> I get asked that question all the time. Which of your fighters are coming up? So I'll I'll, uh, I'll leave that one about my fighters because that'd be just bias. Um, even, even just as a fan, you're thinking yeah. I can't wait to see them get in. You know? If there's one, if there's one guy that I would have to be honest about, uh, and one of my guys competed against him last year, that that I'm that that I watch a lot of, and and um, I just look at him and I think, oh, I love that guy's mentality, and I love what he's doing. He's a uh, little more Kev. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's just what a guy. All the shit he's come through, you yeah. know, his adversities he's come through in life, and the way he's just always yeah. getting about, training here, there, and everywhere, always happy and grafting his bollocks off. He, he's like uh, one guy that every time I look at his stuff, I'm just like, yeah, I hope he gets there. Yeah, he does well, you know. I think he's one of them people as well. People are really expecting him to, you know, to to reach the top, aren't they? And he yeah, just, I think he, so. But yeah. when you look at his, he just looks like he just. Oh, yeah, all that's what I mean. Because like, 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 there's so much expectation, yeah. so much pressure on him, mm. but he's just dealing with it. And he's just mm. cracking on. I love the mentality of fighters though, like Brendan Luchnane's another one who I, I love. Brendan, like, man. So he's in the PFL now, which is another promotion. But he got he fought for a UFC contract, but and got robbed. Won the fight. Got robbed. And because he took a, a double leg and sort of took the guy down, Dana White said, "No, I don't want to see people doing that." Which was just mate. Ridiculous. He went toe to toe yeah. with the guy for fifteen minutes, <laughs> yeah. but on the best performance of the night by a miles, most exciting fight that of yeah. that night by miles. He gets yeah. a takedown in the last minute or so, and Dana White says, "No, you shouldn't have gone for a takedown in the last." But people minute. take people take takedowns to take UFC fights mate, on every single. Mate, card. What did Habib make a career of? <laughs> I know, I know. He made his whole career was pinning oh, yeah. people down and beating them up. But it is meant to like people like him. I've never met him, but so he's away in America now and he's fighting in this PFL for a million dollar contract, yeah, yeah. million dollars or whatever. Yeah. But like you see him and you know he's had these setbacks and like the UFC have said yeah, no, mate, he's but he's not, just did like. Did you see his Bama world title fight? Yeah, yeah. So he fought for Bama world title. I think it was the show before me, or was it on the same? I can't even remember, man. man I've been it too many times. <laughs> I think it was before me. Or it was either on the same night. No, it weren't on the same night. I think it was on the show before me. But because if it was on the same night, it would have been before me. Because I know we had a bit of banter about he was going to be the first Bama World Champion from Manchester. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So his fight was definitely before mine. But. Um, did you see that fight? Yeah, yeah. He, man, he got robbed. He got robbed. He's had such hard luck, and that. and then on the on ACB yeah. when he fought, um, what was he called? The kid from UFC. He he, he just left the Pat Healy. Oh, yeah, yeah. He fought Pat Healy on the UFC, uh, on ACB. Sorry, after Pat had left the UFC, um, and again he just got robbed. So if many you look setbacks. Up, mate, he's had so many yeah. setbacks of things, but he's a perfect example of someone like I was saying earlier who always does 100% mm. of their effort. And then fights that he got lost on, the result was nothing down to him. No. He put 100% into them fights. The result was what it was. He had no control mm. over that. And look at him now. He's just mm. kept going. He's kept Never going, wanted kept someone like you mate, don't know to win a million dollars. I know, mate. He's 15 <laughs> minutes away from winning a million yeah. dollars, mate. He's the, he's the outsider as well. And, you know, you say you're doing better, but I'll be betting on him. Are you, you going to put money on it? Yeah? yeah, just because, like, it's such a... He's For one, he's a brilliant fighter. His form's brilliant. Mid, but, mate. like, it's one of them people... Do you know when you just want someone to get a break? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, 100%, mate. If anyone deserves yeah. it, it's him. I mate, think... Jordan's got a knack, mate, with combat sports of, like... <laughs> 
Mate, he's a fucking genius. He's like, what on the betting side? Yeah, really. Yeah. Well, oh, maybe mate. I'll start betting. <laughs> yeah. Can I get his? Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, mate, you've, mate. You've caught. I mean, obviously that's his bread and butter. But he's called some fights like both UFC boxing, and I'm like called it to a T. Yeah. You do all right, don't you? Don't have much of a life. Like. Is, <laughs> the is with them with the like the betting odds and stuff like that is like they're just going off like um, records and yeah. And there's and there's stuff only so like much you can know, yeah. But momentum, mindset, all that stuff mm. comes into it. And if you look, I always say Brendan is Mr. Consistency. You look at Brendan, mate, I don't think he's had a day off since about 2014. Mm. If that guy has been putting the work in, building mm. momentum for years. It's not yeah. just now, it's not just PFL. He's not just getting famous now and doing this thing because mm. he's in the final. He yeah, was training, like the way he's training for this fight, he was training that same way five years ago, six years ago, yeah. and he never stopped. No. Do you know like what I mean? So the five year um, overnight success. Yeah, yeah, exactly, mate. Years. Exactly. And he's grafted, mate. Mm. So hey, one thing, did I see a photo of you with McGregor as well? You trained with him once or something, or you've Oh yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, What's it like being if shared in the gym with him and then seeing like the level he's like Well I mean I have I've only trained a few trainees. I like I trained out in Iceland with him, uh, going to Nelson's gym for a bit and uh in Dublin a couple of times and then in Vegas. I, I was fighting for Bellator on one of the uh, I think it was a California card, uh, and, and they were fighting. I think it was his first Dustin Poirier fight, mm. somewhere along that lines. Yeah, 2014. Yeah, year. I think it was about then. So we trained out in Vegas together then as well. Um, they had the gym, so John Kavanagh like kind of organised it with Carl Tanzo, my coach, because they were like close for SPG, and um, they organised for us to have the the Fatitas gym, personal gym underneath. Well, yeah. Red Rock Casino. So John and Connor, well, I say for us, they had it for them, <laughs> but they invited us because yeah. that's the type of guy John is. He invited us down and said, mm. do you want to come get some training? So we got a good few training sessions in there. Fucking amazing, mate. But yeah, I mean, I've only trained on the mat with him a handful of times. It's not like I've like... <clears throat> no, the only reason I brought him up is you as a coach now. We had uh, Nick Pete on um, podcast two weeks back and we, he was saying about boxing and MMA. You kind of need to have the talent, but if you want to kind of be that global star and you want to kind of be, you've got to have that, you know, maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, which obviously Connor's you oh, know, yeah. maximised. Yeah. What do you like with your kind of fighters? I mean, how do you kind of teach that? Are you kind of, is that something that you're advising on or are you just focusing on, I mean, because it's, on the it, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually it's something a, I've been thinking about recently. Um, I think it's so fun because, sorry, before you it frustrates me that you could be the best. I always use the yeah. example of Callum Smith, yeah. you know, an unbelievable boxer. But he's never really spoken about. I don't think in in the circles he should, mm. because he's a quiet lad with a family and he doesn't say nothing. Where I don't know other fighters go off all the time and it's like fucking hell. It's the bullshit show, isn't it? It's the society. It frustrates well, me. And I just as a coach, I mean, you've got to remember it is the entertainment business. Mm. It is, you know, fighting is a sport, and obviously, what made me fall in love with it was the skill side and the reality side of it. Yeah, you know, it, what I mean by the reality side of it is like. You, you know you can be you can be the, a WBC boxing world champion but it don't mean you can fight a good leg locker at jiu-jitsu might grab all and snap your ankle in 30 seconds and he's just deep defeated you mm. <laughs> do you know what I mean mm. um, in, if you're a world champion MMA fighter you can fucking fight yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you get what I mean it's real it's as real as it and that's what brought drew, drew me to the sport but it's entertainment as well so it, you kind of have to you don't have to be someone you're not, but you do have to show your personality because you have to draw people to want mm. to watch you, market mm. yourself, you know. And that is something I've been thinking about recently about because a lot, you know, a lot of the thing I do is focus with my fighters on the skill and the personal development within it as well. Uh, but one of the things I want to improve on is to talk to my guys about not being as scared to put your personality out there, let people mm. know who you are, show a bit more of yourself. Not be the grey man. Mm. Yeah, because, you know, unfortunately, be, and don't get me wrong, if, if you just want to be a, have a few fights and do it for personal development, then be the great man, mm. be the great mm. man. But if you want to be signed to the UFC, signed to Cage Royce, Bellator, you want to be a world champion, you want to get paid for this sport, you want to make a living out of it in a career, People who have to watch you. Yeah, fighting's only a part tickets. of it. Isn't it? Mm. Yeah, you have mm. to. The eyes have to be on you. So, so like, I think like there's people like Colby Covington. I spoke to you before. He made this clever. like yeah, he's made. He was the quiet guy, but now he's made this this sort of alter ego. Is he like, the Donald Trump? Donald Trump, Trump guy. Yeah. But then there's people like, for example, a guy who hasn't fought for ages, Cron Gracie, whose family like developed uh, 
all yeah, his yeah, jiu-jitsu yeah. schools. Yeah. No one will really watch Crone Gracie, but you know, apart from people who think, wow, yeah, yeah, watch yeah. that. But then Colby Covington so fights and everyone's like, oh, when's he fighting? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, you know, sorry. Jazza Dickens in boxing, he's, he called it the bullshit show, and it is the bullshit show, a lot of it, but yeah. it, it is what it is. You, it you is have what to it get, is, you mate, and you've got board. to take it for what it is as well. Yeah. You've got to accept that if you want to be a fighter and you want to make a career out of it and do X, Y, and Z and make, make put money out of it and be paid by it, that is part of it. Mm-hmm. The entertainment mm-hmm. side is part of it, you know, whether you like it or not. That doesn't mean you have to be the flamboyant guy gobbing off, but you have to show people something. You have to mm-hmm. show, if you're a quiet guy with a quiet personality, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Let people know that. Yeah, attract other people. quiet people yeah, with yeah, quiet yeah, personality. Yeah, yeah. You've like, got, you, you, you know, be, yeah. the, be the guy that people want to watch for that reason. Mm-hmm. You've got to, you've got to give people a reason to watch you. Mm-hmm. Um, the, and the thing with MMA is there's a million exciting fighters out there. There's a million. You can walk in any gym here, like the, the, look at the gyms around here, you've got Team Kelbon around here, you've got Next Generation mm. around here, you've got Four Corners around here. If I walk into any of them three gyms right now, I guarantee you there's 10 lads on the mat that all of us will go, fucking look at him. Mm. And you'll be thinking, look, yeah, he's, he's mint. You walk into my gym, exactly the same. You watch some of them and you're like, shit, man, he's good. I like to watch him. There's a lot of exciting fighters out there. Yeah. You've also got to bring that entertainment value as well. Or, and I don't mean, like I said, I don't mean entertainment as in, Fucking start juggling on telly or something. <laughs> 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 but you've got, give, yeah, you've got to give people a reason to watch you, aren't you? Yeah, a reason to get to stay up at four AM and watch mm. you buy a ticket for your travel to Newcastle to buy a ticket. You got you got to give them. Mm. It's a big pie these days, mate. You know, mm. and you, you have to fighting's only a part of that. And the more popular it becomes, the mm. more exciting fighters there's going to be, which is great for us all, great for mm. the sport. So the more the talent pool is going to grow, the harder it's going to be. So, yeah. yeah. It's definitely a sport on the up. It's, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I don't know whether I've enjoyed talking about the core more in Afghan and all that, <laughs> or, or the MMA side of things. Yeah, yeah. I reckon we could go for a good yeah, three, four more hours. How long have you been going, by the way? I feel a good it's while. Like- I don't know what's on there. Oh, shit. Yeah. Anything yeah. else, yeah. mate, you want to, um, <laughs> anything else you want to touch on, mate, before we wrap it up? Uh, no, nah, I mean, I just came here, like we spoke yesterday, and we spoke quite a yeah. A while back, and, that, and then when we spoke the other day, I was just like, Yeah, let's go and have a chat. I yeah. just came here to have a chat, really, man. Yeah, just catch up with another boot next, so I'm happy, man. No, I, hope you, I hope you enjoyed the chat anyway, I mate. Done, yeah. It's, um, mate, you know, it's genuine, mate. Again, it's been awesome having you, mate, talking yeah, about the old man. days in the core. And, mate, wish you all the best for the success in the gym. Thanks a lot. It's, um, mate, it's something I'll uh, obviously I see on Instagram. What's your Instagram for anyone who wants to get involved? Uh, Stapes underscore 50 cal. Yeah, um, it's exciting times, right, in the gym, and yeah, look forward to it, mate. It's same here, though, man. This, this here just shows, like, bootneck, man. I always say to people about bootnecks, I always find a way. <laughs> Lads who leave the core, like, bootnecks, they just always find a way to do something, something else, and look at this, man, look what you're doing. This is just fucking... Oh, mate, I'll take that as a compliment from you, <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah, nice yeah. one. Well, <laughs> absolute pleasure, mate. Nice Brilliant. one. Cool, mate. Cheers, lads.